Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar Wednesdays. Uh, this is put on by our FCW, Family Community Wellness Program Area. I'm Marie Bitston, the coordinator or um, your host, I guess, for this uh, these webinars. Today we are very pleased that Jane Strumman is going to be with us and sharing uh, her information on planning for care for your loved one and yourself. Jane is a gerontology specialist with in the FCW program area in human development and family science. Uh, before I turn it over to Jane, just to let all of you know that these webinars are um, put on our long-term uploads under FCW webinars so that you can see them in um, the afterwards if you want to go back to the webinar as well as the PowerPoint, any handouts, things like that I'll post after we're done. So Jane, thank you very much for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marie. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the topic of family caregiving. Tips and tools for you and your loved ones. It's an area that I am uh, very passionate about, so I'm pleased to be sharing some information about family caregiving. Uh, during uh, our next minutes together during this webinar, we're just going to talk about what are those key issues that family caregiver, caregivers of older adults, but we'll be talking about caregiving in general, uh, that they deal with. Um, what are some common stressors that family caregivers experience? And we'll talk about some strategies to help manage the caregiver stress. And really important, too, is to talk about what are those resources available to, to help uh, family caregivers in their journey. Um, so if during uh, the, the webinar, if you have any questions, you certainly can type them in in the chat box, and I'll try to keep an eye on them. Or certainly just um, chime in um, and let me know what they are, too, using your microphone. So we'll hope to uh, take care of those as we go along. So let's um, get started. You know, you may or may not identify yourself as a caregiver. For example, spouses often just take care of their husband or wife because that's what spouses do, right? So who is a caregiver? Consider the following examples. Many adult children gradually start helping their aging parents and they don't think of themselves as caregivers. Parents of children with special health or behavioral needs don't see them as themselves as caregivers either. Grandparents who are raising their grandchildren see themselves only as grandparents loving their grandkids. Spouses and family members of military members who come back from war wounded and needing care don't see themselves as caregivers. Family members living at a distance but still helping a loved one don't see themselves as caregivers. Children and teens also are serving as caregivers for sick siblings, parents, or aging relatives. And many caregivers are of older people are older adults, and many of those caregivers are in poor to uh, their health. So caregiving is an activity that occurs across many different settings, and all are caregivers. So are you providing um, any of the types of the, the, these services listed on, on the, this slide? Have, are you providing them now or have you provided them in the past? You see there's quite an array. I'm not going to read them for you, um, but they, they range from financial things to doing personal care and everything in between. If, if you have, then you are a caregiver. And if you do not, you probably know somebody who's providing these types of care. Rosalind Carter, former First Lady of the United States, made this insightful statement. There are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. This is a very great quote. So I want to just take a couple minutes before we get into some of the other material just to look at some maybe myths about caregiving, myths and realities. And so I've got a few statements. And uh, let's look at each statement. And why don't you type in, if you would, in the chat box what you think would 
be the, the correct answer, true or false. So for the first one, the most common care decision that families need to make about care for aging adults is about what type of care facility in which to have them live. What do you think? Is that true or false? Yet. Most people reply in saying that it's it's false. Um, one true. Well, the answer is false. Most care provided to older adults is done by family caregivers in a home setting. Family caregivers actually provide 70 to 80 percent of all the community-based care needed by older adults. The most common care decision is who will provide family-based care when it's needed, not which type of facility. So let's look at the next statement. Adult daughters are the most common primary caregivers when family care is given to an aging or needing adult. What do you think about that? Is that true or false? True, true, true. Lots of true. Lots of, lots of trues. Well, the, the correct answer for this is actually false. It's kind of a myth that adult daughters are the most common primary caregiver, but the most common primary caregivers are first the spouses, either husbands or wives, followed by daughters and daughters-in-law. So adult daughters provide a great deal of care, but for aging spouses to be in this circumstances is the most common. What about the statement, women provide most of the direct care that's given in family caregiving situations to aging parents or family members? Does that seem like true or false to you? Getting kind of a theme of true on that one. Yeah, that is true. It, um, while in some cultures, um, adult sons have that tradition of providing care. Even in those situations, women, such as daughters-in-law or other women in the family, provide the most direct care. However, involvement by men in direct care is increasing, we are seeing. And the last statement, the feelings of obligation that an adult child feels toward a parent are the strongest predictor of how often an adult child has contact with a parent. What do you think about that one? True or false? The feelings of obligation. few more falses than, than true. Well, the correct answer is false, so great job on that. Um, there, the reality of this is that although an adult child's feelings of obligation are important, the biggest factor in regular contact between adult children and parents is proximity, how close they live to the parent. The next most important factor is the feelings of parent-adult-child closeness that exist and then the third factor is the feeling of, ob of obligation. So thanks for participating in that. So we're going to talk of, about family caregiving. And you know, each of us is growing older, and the people we love and care about are growing older, and they may have care needs. And this might include our parents, our siblings, children, spouses, our in-laws, other family um, members or even friends and neighbors. A common experience is giving care to a family member in need, which is also often referred to as family caregiving. And it can uh, include things like providing help and assistance through um, basic regular tasks like personal care, household chores, financial management, emotional support, or giving food and shelter uh, to dependent adults or family members. And it can really vary the type of care provided based on the intensity needed and the duration of care that's provided. 
So the, let's just talk about the benefits of caregiving. It, the caregiving experience can really be a positive um, experience with many positive benefits to the both the caregiver and the care recipient. I use the, uh, the term care recipient is also often used in kind of this field, but it kind of includes that whole realm of people I just talked to that you might be caring for, whether it's your, your spouse or parents or children, friends, neighbors, and such. So you'll hear me use that, that term throughout. So recognizing the positive aspect of the experience can really give perspective and needed hope when stress in, increases along the journey. So some of the positive benefits of Caregiving for the caregiver includes just really developing that uh, closer relationships. You're spending more time with the, the person. Um, increased understanding and, and an opportunity to maybe heal some past difficulties for the person. Um, certainly patience um, is involved in the caregiving experience and um, personal growth from that as well. Um, for the person receiving that care, uh, that care is very personal. You know, it's from somebody who really cares about you. And it's very individualized and attentive to that person, that, that uniqueness of the person. Um, they're sharing life experiences with, with another person. And also, it's providing uh, that relationship building as well. So many positive um, benefits of caregiving. So... I want to talk about the, the planning to care because I um, providing care is important, but the planning piece is really critical. You know, the time to plan for care needs of a family member is before the person needs that care, or at least be, before the person become the, those care needs become really significant. Uh, when we're in good health, is a time to plan ahead because typically that's when we have more options available to us. And we have the time to think and talk with others about preferences and decisions. Um, it's not a good idea to wait for a crisis to, to occur before talking about those preferences for future care, um, such as where a person will live or details about finances. Um, that often happens, and it's usually not the ideal situation. You know, planning for care needs is similar to planning for retirement. The earlier, the better. So there are some unique circumstances that are important to consider that might arise and affect the caregiving plans. And they can include uh, whether the move into caregiving is sudden or gradual. There are many times that it is sudden. You know, somebody is, has a diagnosis or a car accident, um, a stroke, those types of things. Or it can be a gradual move, somebody who is just getting older and maybe more frail. Um, the type of illness or care needed is really important. Um, for example, caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or some other type of brain impaired condition can be much more challenging in some situations than caring for somebody with a physical impairment. And then the type of caregiver is important. Um, is that caregiver um, long distance caregiving? because that can be difficult emotionally and just logistically and not as hands-on. Um, there are many working caregivers today that are trying to balance the need um, between their time caregiving and their job and oftentimes their own children um, while they're doing this caregiving role. So that can add some complications and complexities to it as well. And then... Uh, where you live, are you in an urban or rural setting? Caregivers in rural settings face unique challenges. There's usually fewer formal services available, such as you know, health care, transportation difficulties, uh, weather problems in the winter, as you know, this winter, a prime example, if somebody has health care appointments and they're trying to navigate the roads and these weather forecasts or just the geographic distance and, and the isolation that they might experience. And then uh, there are greater um, uh, cultural differences in caregiving too. With, with greater diversity means that you know, families are bringing their own, their histories, their traditions, 
um, rituals and preferences to the caregiving experiences. And many cultures have family expectations about the caregiving roles of family members. So with that, let's talk a little bit about some of those tips for caregivers and what's important. The first caregiving tip is to really size up the situation. You know, what do you know and what do you need to know? Establishing a baseline of information can be really helpful in making current and future care decisions. Um, to do this, it's important to consider kind of the following steps. You know, talk to that person in need of care and loved ones, family members, and friends, and really seek to understand their awareness and perspective of the situation. And then ask yourself the following, what, if anything, has changed for the care recipient? And what specifically is happening that requires attention? And what is happening or needs to happen to, make specific, to meet specific care needs? And then it's important to get um, either medical, mental health, or care need assessments or diagnoses made. You really need to have a clear picture of what's happening. You need basic information that's going to give you a realistic awareness of the care situation. And there are um, a variety of professionals that can assist in doing the, these types of formal assessments of care or medical needs as well. And then lastly, it's important to educate yourself on the care needs or the illnesses or related topics. Learn as much as you can about the illness or the situation so that you can understand what's happening. Uh, you can't know it all because this isn't a job that you are likely trained for. But knowledge is available. And there are many sources, um, uh, uh, good sources for information, and that includes the healthcare professionals, you know, books, articles, online information sources, associations, um, or support groups. And associations like um, the ALS Association, the MS Association, Parkinson's Association, Alzheimer's Associations, those are all really credible, credible organizations that can really help you understand and, and get the information that you need as well. So a second tip, talking about the big issues, and this could be just a whole webinar on itself, just this slide, and I'm just going to touch briefly on uh, some of these, these areas. Um, Financial considerations are really important in the caregiving situation and planning ahead. Um, what financial resources are available for care? Most people prefer to keep their financial affairs private, right? And I think that's a pretty common feeling amongst people. But to best prepare and provide for a family member's care, you really need to gain a full understanding of the person's financial assets and their liabilities. Um, you can do this by developing a list of assets and liabilities, um, getting a list of their accounts, social security income, things like CDs, stocks, bonds, real estate deeds, insurance policies, annuities, retirement or pension benefits, uh, credit card debt, um, if there's a home mortgage and loans, and so forth. Um, also, it's important to research the costs of home and community-based care option if these types of care might be needed in the future. Um, so I can't stress enough that care uh, can be expensive. And sometimes people don't, we don't want to think about that time in our life where we might need that care, and so we kind of avoid it. And sometimes it's a, it's a big shock to people when they realize um, what things cost and that they don't have the resources to, to, to cover that. The other area is legal considerations. Um, do you have the legal documents in place that will authorize another person to make um, legal, financial, and healthcare decisions on your behalf or someone else? Um, are there are legal documents such as uh, social security numbers, um, birth, marriage, death certificates, divorce decrees, property settlements, um, military records, income tax returns, wills, trusts, agreements, um, 
and burial arrangements, are they in an accessible location? Um, at some point, um, all of these might, some of these might be needed to term eligibility for public programs such as Medicaid. Um, and so I'll just add, you know, as far as these being in an accessible location, have you told somebody where they are? And I'll just give a little caveat about um, the caregiving situation I was in with my, my husband for my in-laws who became sudden diagnosis and um, we needed to step in right away as you know helping with caregiving and my in-laws had done the work of getting these documents in place uh, they didn't tell us that they had named me their, the, their person for their health care directives and my husband as the person for their financial affairs in, the, in these documents. Nor did they give us a copy or nor did they remember where they were after they were um, in a sudden diagnosis of a malignant brain tumor and the other one had dementia. And so we were on a kind of a wild goose chase to find these documents. And so just the fact that they're in an accessible location, um, talk to people, let them know where they're at, they're at as well. Um, healthcare considerations. What is the type of illness or frailty that your family member um, has? It's really going to determine what care, the type of care that they're going to need. Can they receive care in the home or from a community-based service or will they need to be in a facility? How much is it going to cost? Again, back to that cost. Um, talk about your family members' wishes and preferences for care and incorporate in this into their, their plan of care. Um, this is so important um, as we think about nursing home care being, you know, can easily be $100,000 a year. Um, these, are, these are big financial considerations. Um, uh, thinking about what type of care somebody would need and are these are these types of care that your loved one prefers, are they available in the community? Will they have to move to get that type of care? And the last big issue is housing. Um, there's a variety of issues related to housing to consider, such as how adaptable is your family member's home? Would a family member who became disabled or couldn't use the stairs be able to stay in that person's home? What would making a con the, um, either minor or, or major accommodations or modifications to the house cost? And is the home safe? Um, is this where your loved one wants to live? Um, do they do they want to move in with you? <laughs> These are all big issues to talk about, and sometimes. Uh, these are the types of things that we, we often um, would prefer not to address and then they become um, really challenges to families um, later down the road when that caregiving is needed. So a third tip is to form a support team. Um, that can really work together in providing care that's needed. You know, caring for a family member or friend is really a big responsibility and it typically is more than one person can handle. Uh, trying to handle all the caregiving by yourself can lead to burnout and having your own health care problems. So forming a supportive network of family, friends, uh, your neighbors, your coworkers, etc., can be a, a tremendous help in caring for your family member. Uh, there's a book that I found called Share the Care that does a wonderful job of talking about how you can form a care plan and and look at you know what um, a care assessments should be considered. Um, for example, what type of um, care is needed around the personal care? You know the bathing, eating, dressing, toileting, grooming. How about household care? The cooking, cleaning, laundry, um, health care, that whole health care management, um, you know, medical appointments, medication management, um, the emotional care. Uh, how about providing, you know, this includes um, like companionship, meaningful activities, a conversation. Uh, supervision, just oversight of um, somebody's safety at home or 
in a situation where somebody has dementia, preventing laundering. And then the financial management, that financial slash legal management of all of those types of things. So a care plan really can be a work in progress because your loved one's needs are going to change through time. Um, start by listing all the things you're capable or have time for and are willing to do. And then list those things that you would like some help with or might need help with now or in the future. And then next, think about all of your informal support, such as your siblings, other family members, friends, neighbors, and think about how each person might be able to provide assistance. And I think this is really important because caregiving is, I can't stress enough, a big responsibility. And I have just been um, helping and providing care for my sister the last six months who has gone through some very significant health challenges. And she's married, but uh, my, my brother-in-law works full-time as well. And we have, you know, we kind of had said, well, we're, my sister's name is Dawn, and it's like we're Team Dawn. The two of us have been trying to uh, work together to make sure all the things that needed to be done as we looked at these types of assessments. And um, it, it was really helpful to have a team. We were a small team, but you know, it was really helpful in this situation. So now we're going to talk about um, some of the stress that can occur and some of the tips that are available for managing that. You know, uh, providing care directly to a family member or adult who has some specific health or personal care needs and challenges has a big, big impact on a person's lives. Um, we talked about that, you know, it does provide some really positive benefits, but it also creates challenges that may come due to increased stress, uh, individual fatigue, and financial hardships. Most individuals have experience with providing care to young or adolescent children, but how do you go about taking over payment of bills for a mother-in-law who's paid her own bills for much of her life? Or how do you know which items to buy at the grocery store when an aging sibling can no longer make the trip? You know, fortunately, there's, there's a, uh, an increasing amount of information and useful resources that are available to help caregivers reduce their stress and provide high quality care. So we're going to look now at some of the potential areas of stress related to family caregiving. And I say potential again because I said the caregiving experience can be so unique. Uh, some caregivers are doing very infrequent things, maybe helping take somebody grocery shopping every week, where another caregiver might be doing full-time, 24-hour um, care for, for somebody. So um, the, the stress level that a family caregiver experiences is very unique to their situation. So these are the four areas, the physical demands, the financial demands, emotional burden, and relationship challenges. So we'll talk about these. With um, caregiving, you know, oftentimes there, there's some basic, basic or practical aspects of care, such as, you know, helping somebody with bathing or dressing or transferring from a bed to a wheelchair. Um, when, when these tasks are performed for a dependent adult or young person, the resulting demands and labor can become challenging and stressful to a, a caregiver. Um, these are, and oftentimes, you know, we see a lot of caregivers that are older. We, we talked about spouses being the primary caregiver in the most common um, situation, and they're older as well, and they're trying to provide these types of um, uh, tasks for another individual. So they can be very stressful. So. Um, some of the, the, the tips, you know, to deal with this is, is get some training so that you're doing things properly so that you don't injure yourself and you're not second-guessing yourself about that. And um, there's a, many different people, healthcare professionals and nurses that can, can help with, with those types of questions. Taking care of yourself. 
oftentimes we see the caregiver neglecting their, themselves and their health for the health of the person they're caring for. So nutrition, exercise, sleep, all those things we know are important for wellness. It's important to practice that, and sometimes it, it is very difficult for a caregiver to do that. Um, getting help with tasks. We just talked about how important it is to have a team. Uh, working with working to keep family members independent. The more uh, uh, the care recipient or loved one can do for themselves, you know, with the dressing, eating, bathing, those types of things, the, the better it will be for the caregiver. And there are many uh, uh, adaptive types of equipment available today. Um, North Dakota Assistive is an organization in North Dakota that has just a wealth of products and equipment available to help people so it's not so physically demanding to provide that care. So those are just a few types of tips. Financial demands that um, uh, caregiving often takes a financial toll on caregivers and family members. Um, there is the cost of health care, medical care, the treatment, costs of hiring help, and the equipment that you might need, uh, not to um, even mention the, the costs in income for a caregiver who might have to reduce the number of hours that they work to provide those caregiving responsibilities. And with the lost income might uh, come loss of employee benefits as well. Um, and long-term care needs as well. So many financial challenges and um, it's important that uh, caregivers uh, utilize the programs that might help with costs, um, identify programs that pr can provide that assistive technology or equipment at reduced fees. I just mentioned the organization that does that in North Dakota and each state has one like North Dakota have assisted, and uh, discuss family needs with the entire family that's involved. It's important, um, uh, finances can be a very difficult um, topic to, to talk about, but it's important that the family members understand what the needs are, and maybe together you can, can uh, look for some solutions. And of course, uh, as I said, um, in the planning piece that you know, plan ahead for costs. Well, let's not stick our head in the sand and think this might not ever happen or think about the future, um, but to plan and do the research um, about the costs that might be incurred with care needed. And then there are many specialists that you can work with around the finances too, and it can be from a county social service eligibility worker to um, your uh, financial consultant, legal consultant, somebody that can help um, with uh, sorting things out. And around um, the emotional burdens. Um, caregiving can re really be a tiresome experience that feels emotionally challenging, especially if it continues for um, an extended period of time. And we often talk about the emotional demands are really the hidden costs of caregiving. And they may be most severe in their stress impact on a family caregiver. I think that's really important to understand. Feeling sad, um, fear, anxiety, guilt, regret, frustration, depression, and even anger is quite common for caregivers. We know that anger, resentment, and guilt are the three most common uh, emotions felt by caregivers and and those are really our difficult emotions and to be able to understand that um, that that comes often with the territory is important so some of those coping tips so what do we do about knowing that is you know being realistic about the demands of caregiving you know what are you able to do as a caregiver uh, with what you know today of the situation um, and that you're one person, and to be realistic about that. Um, talk to somebody about your caregiving situation. Oftentimes people feel isolated and alone. Uh, giving time to self-care. If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to, to continue caring for your loved one if you're not well. 
take advantage of respite care. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more too in an upcoming slide, but respite care, getting that much needed break is sometimes a, a real critical piece to be able to continue in the caregiving role. Um, join a caregiver support group. Oftentimes just um, being able to talk to people that have been in that shared experience is very helpful to people to, to understand that. And then get help from other people. Get assistance from others, and maybe that's counseling or talking to, to others that might be able to help. And then the last area, category of stress, is around relationship challenges. And, um, you know, caregiving may change just really the normal patterns of a person's individual or family life, and sometimes they can result in uh, these relationship challenges that make life more stressful. Uh, for example, adult si siblings might disagree about a care plan, or an adult child and dependent parent might have conflict about the level of care or monitoring required. There's, um, there's many things that contribute to those relationship challenges, and oftentimes you know, on, on the list here, you know, insufficient time or energy, um, uh, criticism or lack of help from other family members that are, are not helping like you would like them to be in the situation. And so uh, this is very common, very common, even though you think it might never happen within your family or, or, or people close to you, it, it often is a challenge for for family caregivers. So it's really important to like focus on those positive experiences uh, with the person you're caring for, with, with your other family members. Um, it makes sure that the person you're caring for, that you involve them in discussions as much as possible. Sometimes if uh, a dementia diagnosis is involved, that becomes more difficult. Um, express needs and issues clearly. This is, we talk often with an extension, how important effective communication is. This is really critical in caregiving. We need to be um, assertive in expressing what the needs are without blaming. Uh, we need to, we need other, we can't assume other people will know what our needs are or our frustrations unless we're able to communicate those effectively. We need to make sure that we're not neglecting other important people in our lives too because of this caregiving situation. And you know, if, if we do, um, oftentimes you know, these challenges present themselves. And we, we talk a little bit, you know, the first source of stress is listed there as feeling resentful of care recipient. And I heard a speaker once talk about this feeling of resentment is, is to really think about drawing a line across the middle of your body, kind of where your belly button is. And that is that line. And that line of resentment was, is you can do so much as a caregiver, but once you are doing too much where it affects so many other areas of your life, you become resentful, and that's really that line <laughs> that you're crossing, and that's just to recognize that and to step back, and that's where you really need to reassess the situation and see what is it that I need at this time. I need some help. What resources and people can I reach out to? So with with that, there's there's a lot of stresses as we talked about, but there are some helpful resources for uh, the caregiving experience. Um, you know, support and resources um, in this caregiving process can come in lots of different forms. It can be talking to family or friends, uh, visit with professionals, um, you know, accessing um, equipment that will be helpful, um, our spiritual life, um, all of these um, types of um, access to information and resources can provide really an important source of understanding and connection and assistance. Um, and it's really important that caregivers really reach out for these resources that can provide them the needed, the knowledge and the skills and assistance that they need. And 
one of the things that I will be um, sharing with after this webinar is over, as, as well as the slides, I will share a publication or a handout that we have about helpful resources for family caregivers. Um, and uh, it's specific to North Dakota, but we have many state level resources for caregivers. And we have included um, the key organizations that really are involved in uh, family caregivers. And those would be the ones that you, know, you would want to reach out to first, as well as some national and professional resources for caregivers and online resources as well and then some disease-specific resources for caregivers. So it's a, it's a really helpful handout. And so look for that along with these slides following uh, the webinar. So um, we'll talk about each of these categories just briefly. Um, so to look at um, informal support, um, that includes um, sources such as family members, friends, neighbors, your faith community, um, and many, many others. These often are individuals who are willing to provide support, but often they're unaware of what's needed or how to be helpful. So it's important that caregivers learn to advocate for themselves. Avoid withdrawing from family members and friends because this will lead to a sense of isolation and discouragement. Instead, identify individuals in your circle of informal support that could be approached with a request for support in the caregiving process. Reluctance in asking for and accepting help is a major barrier in getting the necessary respite and support that caregivers need. When we look at um, formal support, there's a variety of uh, services and supports that are available to help caregivers in the community setting. And those community resources can be you know, home delivered meals, um, transportation, adult daycare facilities. Uh, it can include uh, respite care. Uh, respite is very important for caregivers, especially those who are providing a pretty intense uh, type of caregiving, for them to be able to, to have some time and some hours to themselves just to take care of themselves and and to um, to re-energize is it, sometimes the, the key to, to them being able to continue in that role. And respite care can be provided in the home. It could be provided in the community, such as an adult daycare center, and it can be provided in a facility, such as a nursing home can provide that short-term respite stay as well. And then support groups can be really an important and valued source of insight, connection, and experience um, to meet other people that are in that similar situation. And I think I touched on that briefly. Um, and then state and professional resources. Um, we have a division of aging services, our social services departments, um, in the state, um, national organizations. AARP has a wealth of information for caregivers on their website. Uh, short videos on many, many topics. It's uh, very helpful as well. And then many professional association and state chapters that um, we've included again on this handout that you can refer to. And then I want to talk about, again, the, the idea of self-care. We've mentioned that in the past. Um, it's important to do that, but how can caregivers take care of themselves? You know, learning those skills for self-care is really important. Um, and regardless of how much care you provide, taking care of yourself is an important ingredient for wellness. And NDSU Extension provides a program for caregivers called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. And it offers caregivers the opportunity to learn a variety of tools, um, reducing you know, personal stress, changing negative self-talk, um, communi communicating feelings and needs to others, um, communicating in challenging situations, 
there's two different kinds of communication styles that are taught in this program. Um, setting limits, asking for help, um, dealing with those really difficult emotions and changes, and then making really some of the tough caregiving decisions. And this is a, a program that uh, many of our extension family and community wellness agents are trained as class leaders along with another community partner. Uh, these are uh, six week workshops that are offered in communities for family caregivers. And there, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about um, how to find out about workshops and where they might be available. And, and uh, there are two, currently two curriculums that are involved in, uh, that are part of this national evidence-based program. One is for family caregivers of adults with chronic illness. And that is the one that we've been using in North Dakota. The second one is for, for parents of children with special health and behavioral needs. We have not offered that one yet. We're hoping to do that. We have a number of class leaders who are, um, either from our family, parent family resource centers or, or working with other um, organizations that would be interested in kind of this target audience. And it's really been a very positive um, program to, to offer. And what we find is um, family caregivers who are coming to this uh, you know, education really need to be there. Um, they're, they're looking for this. There's usually uh, most of the education that's provided is about taking care of the care recipient, not about taking care of the caregiver. And so this has been a really positive program. I was hoping to, to show you um, a video. There's a short video um, that was developed by um, the, the agents and uh, um, Chandra and, and Vanessa in our Bismarck Mandan Extension offices. They had interviewed uh, two, uh, two people who had taken uh, the Powerful Tools for Caregivers workshop, and it's kind of testimonial video. It's on the Extension website, which I'll give you the link to uh, in the next slide. But if you have time and you want to check it out and hear what people are saying about this, this program, um, take a look at it. It's only about a little under five minutes. and. Um, you can find it um, if you go to the extension, um, you know, the slash aging, um, and you'll see powerful tools for caregivers listed there. If you just click on that, you'll find find this video. So, um, and then you can find out more information about it. So I am going to um, stop there um, and just see if anybody has any specific questions or anything that they would um, like to, to mention. I kind of rattle through my slides fairly quickly. Jane, I, I had a question. I know that you were talking about some North Dakota um, resources. Are all of those on this website as well for the, the one, the aging one? Uh, that, that's a great question, Marie. The, the, the resources are not on the website specifically, but that's a really great idea. Uh, this uh, handout that we have was really just developed for this family caregiving lesson that it, you've just gotten here. Uh, it's one of the handouts that's part of the lesson that our agents now have available to them, but it would probably be a great thing to have along um, with this website on caregiving. So thanks. I will make sure it's on there, but I definitely will be sending it to you with these slides. Great. And uh, you mentioned it already, Jane, but those slides will go, the PowerPoint and the handouts will go up on the long-term download so that all of it's together. Yes, absolutely. The, the handout on helpful resources for family caregivers, I'm, I'm really pleased with that because I have um, we tried to uh, whittle it down to those key organizations that if I were the family caregiver and looking for, for help, these are, the, these are the organizations that I would go to first because sometimes it is overwhelming for family members to know where to start and they don't even know 
what they need. <laughs> and so I've tried to, to list those state level resources that are available in, if not every region, you know, they're, they're in every region, often every county. So any, yeah, any other questions or I'd be happy to, to, to answer any, and if not. I do see a question here. Um, would we put them on Google Drive and not long-term downloads? That's a good question that Jeannie had. Well, I was wondering if we were going to do it that way instead, because I don't know is long-term downloads still happening, or do we just put it on Google, Google Docs? So... Oh, SharePoint. Okay, I know that we've put on um, all of our things and shared it on Google Drive. So I don't do the SharePoint with the agents. This is Becky, and it's still being worked on, but eventually, like I said, the stuff that's in for employees on the web anyway will be moving to SharePoint, but when that was discussed at, I think it was the specialist meeting, it was pretty much agreed that, well, stuff that's already in Google Drive, that's silly to move, but people may not know where it is on Google Drive, and in SharePoint, everything will be there for the entire organization, but yeah, we're not going to move people's stuff that's in a Google Drive. However, we may move eventually, this is way down the road, we may eventually move the long-term and short-term downloads. So perhaps this uh, could go on both places, and then uh, agents can find them wherever they're um, more used to going to. Maybe we could do it that way. That's, that sounds like a reasonable plan. That's a good idea because I, I just basically put things on Google Drive so right now. So. And then Molly, you have, could you send, uh, please send a link as sometimes I can't access things without a link. Is that for Google Docs or the download? Oh, for Google Drive, okay. So you, um, you should be able to access it through your NDSU um, account. Um, so, but you've got to have the link to the exact Google folder. And well, I share it with them, so I put it on. You know, I share the our files, and then it would be in that file. So, am I doing that right, Becky? I think so. It's just that. You have created a file and other people have created a file, so that's why she's saying send the link so I know I'm getting into the right Google Drive. Oh, sure, sure. We're sure. getting a okay. bunch of them out there now. <laughs> okay, got it. I can yeah. do that. Yep, no problem. Yeah, that's that's the only complication where eventually if we do move some things to SharePoint, then you log in once and you'll see all of the extension SharePoint folders. So that's the only difference. But, yeah, for now... Google Drive is fantastic. As long as you don't have your personal Gmail open, and then I always get confused. <laughs> it won't let me in my NDSU one if I'm in my Gmail one. We're getting into technicalities here, but yeah, that's great. You guys are saving things so staff can get to them. Wonderful. Anything else for Jane? I see that Greg posted something. Oh. And there's a lot of thank yous there, yes. Jane, that I see, yes. which I'll include mine too, Jane. That was very informative. And um, I would guess that all of us, if we aren't already, we will be doing caregiving <laughs> at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely, Marie. It's, it's uh, something that is uh, that will impact all of us at some point in our lives if it hasn't up to this point. So good information for us. And I'll just say that I, 
I was a long-term care administrator, facility-based, community-based for uh, many, many, many years. And, you know, I've I knew, helped family caregivers, hundreds of them, but it is different being the family caregiver. Um, so there are stresses that come with that. And I learned things through this Powerful Tools program as well. So, so yeah, we, we need to help each other. So appreciate sharing this with, with other people, too, that might be in that family caregiving situation. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to share this with all of us. And uh, we'll continue to reach out, I guess, when we do have other questions. But there's a lot of great resources that you've provided, too, Jane. So thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. All right, everyone, thank you for being on our webinar today. Look for another webinar in two weeks. On the 27th, we'll have Megan Diedrich talking about policy system and environment, uh, PSE, and what it means. And then on April 10th, uh, our last webinar for this year, Energizing Entrepreneurs with Jody Brun. So thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.